All right, gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, the 20th chapter, beginning with the first verse. This is a parable that Jesus told. Hear these words. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them all the denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went out. He went out again about the sixth hour, and the ninth hour did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. So he said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came, and each received a denarius. So when those who came, those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more because each of them had worked all day. But each of them also received the denarius. When they had received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But the landowner answered them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave to you. And don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious? Because I am generous. So, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Jesus is the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, friends? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. Heard your scripture read, and now as I offer words to your people. I pray that they're your words, that you would work through me, around me, or whatever it takes, so that your word is given to your people. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. But last week, I was ready to go. I mean, I, if I... If I hadn't tested the positive, I could have been here and preached. Uh, I, felt, I felt just fine. And I had a great sermon all ready to go on forgiveness. And, and it was about the, the 78th time. Uh, you know, you get up to the, 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 the scripture was about Jesus telling his disciples, you know, don't forgive seven times. Forgive 77 times. So, or in some translations, 70 times 7 times. Numbers don't translate as well uh, from uh, Greek to English. And so there's some debate on the translation. But the point is that God wants you to lose track. Uh, not like uh, the, the count on, on Sesame Street who has the a one, a, a, a two, a no. Now, to... to Forget how many about how many times it is, and to forgive so that it becomes a way of living, almost like breathing. The, the, the forgiveness flows from you, not necessarily the forgetting. Uh, remember, uh, forgiveness is a redeemed way 
of remembering. For some situations, you <laughs> must remember the, the, the sin, uh, situations of abuse or, or, and, and things of that nature, where, where someone is, at, is an actual danger, that it would be harmful to yourself to, to forget about what they did, knowing that they will, could cause you harm. It is not a good idea to forget that. But it is a good idea to forgive it. And that simply means that, that without that person saying, hey, I'm sorry, or, or, or offering any sort of, of repentance, that the, the, the sin that has is, is been committed against you, the harm that's been done to you, doesn't become something that, that fills your soul and contaminates you. Uh, something that, that leads to bitterness and anger and, and <laughs> all of the negative things that can happen to a person. Um, to let go of the, the right to be right and, and just be the one who forgives. Not an easy thing to do, especially when they're not repentant. Especially when they're, they're, they're trying to give you their anger, trying to give you um, the, 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 the burden of their heart. But not to allow that. Uh, so that you become the scorekeeper. Um, how many of you, when you sin, when you, you don't quite make the mark with God, you, you think about God up there in heaven with the, the, the chalkboard. Oh, they sinned again. Man, John just keeps on. Oh, oh no, there he goes again. I can't even keep up. Oh, my goodness. If God were that way, if God kept a tally of our <laughs> sins, how full of chalk would several chalkboards be of our continuing to fall short, to continuing to sin. Now, God, he doesn't just wipe the slate clean with his forgiveness. He throws the chalkboard away. There is no chalkboard. Just forgiveness, grace, offered to us so freely through his son, Jesus Christ, who gives to us Something that is supernatural, something that is a miracle. Uh, not only the forgiveness of our sins. If that were all that Christ had done for us, how wonderful that would be to be forgiven of our sins is, is a miracle. But God's grace continues to work in our lives drawing us even closer and deeper into the heart of God, to be part of God's kingdom on earth. So it's easy for, for, for those who, who marinate in church life to say, yeah, I am forgiven. Yeah, God, Jesus does love me. We sing the, the, the little song, Jesus loves me, this I know. But then... You begin to think of those who are uh, sinners, those who are scoundrels, those who are unrepentant, those who are just downright nasty at times. And you think, oh, my chalkboard is not as full as theirs. Yeah. Their sins are much worse than my sins are. I don't have all the things that they do. And, and that's where the, the parable that Jesus tells uh, about the, the, the workers in the vineyards, that's where Jesus telling us to not keep score uh, comes in. Because it can become easy for, for those of us who, who have walked with Christ for a very long time and, and, and know our sins are forgiven, know we still fall short, but also know that Christ is more willing to forgive than we are to ask. It becomes a burden to think of ourselves better 
than, than those who uh, are quite obviously falling short of God's expectations. And when that happens, we are our, guess what? We're sinning, <laughs> we're falling short, because not only does God's grace follow us uh, after we've come to a, a, a saving relationship with Him, but God's grace pursues us before we even know it. And, and that grace is for everyone. From the lowest of the, the low to the highest of the high, it is the same grace for all. An invitation to come and to experience the presence of God in your life through Jesus Christ. That invitation is always being given. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. You know, the, the, the provision that God provides, not only for our daily bread, our daily needs, but also for the daily grace that we need, is always being given to everyone. You will never see someone in your life who God doesn't love. You will never encounter the face of somebody who God has given up on. There's always grace being given, even to the most vile of effect. An example from our scripture reading today of Moses leading those people into the, the wilderness. The, they've experienced the, the miracles. They've experienced walking through the sea. And now they are wondering, is, uh, what are we going to eat? Are we there yet? You know, they're burdened by what, what's next. How, how do we exist in this place? And God's way of providing for them is this strange miracle of providing food in the form of manna. I love the, the word manna because in the original uh, language, it simply means, what is it? You know, it it's a miracle. What is it? It, it? it lasts for the time that they are in the, the wilderness, and when they get to cross the Jordan, it's no longer provided. That manna is given to all of the people of Israel, whether they are a priest or a prophet or someone on the very outskirts, the, the, the lowest of the low, the, 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 the sinner in their midst. Everyone receives the same provision just as everyone receives the same grace. Title of my message this morning, uh, this here is junk. It, it is a family uh, story. <laughs> my mom provided for us food. Every day she would make something for dinner and, and we were a family of four kids and two adults, and, and sometimes you just had to make do. And, but if you've ever lived with a tight budget, you know that you don't want things to go to waste. And so one of the, those meals that my mom provided, uh, uh, she took some cabbage, she took some potatoes, and she sliced up the potatoes, and she had some kibasi, and she chopped up the kibasi, and she threw it all into a skillet. And, and, and kind of boiled it and, and, and made it this, this little meal. Wasn't much, but she gave it to all of us. And I was sitting there next to my dad, and my dad took the salt shaker and <laughs> you want some? Yes, I do. Uh, I said, I asked my dad, what is this? <laughs> and his response was, this here is junk. <laughs> and we ate it, 
and, and then any time after that, when my mom would, would it became part of the the, the, the regular menu, and we, she would always say, "Hey, I'm making junk tonight." <laughs> I'm making junk, and we all knew exactly what it meant. <laughs> My mom cooked for efficiency, not for uh, flavor. Gordon Ramsay was not knocking on the door waiting to, <laughs> to, to invite her in. But it was what we needed, and it was always there. And even if it was not something that was the, the you know, exactly what, what we were hoping for, it was always what we needed. Uh, God's grace is always there. Like daily bread, we, we think of what, what we need, God provides. And, and not only of those uh, physical needs, but especially of the spiritual needs that we have. To, to know that we can be forgiven and set free of the burden of our sin, and set free of the burden of bearing anxiety and, and anger with someone else very best example I can think of to go along with the, the, the parable that we uh, have of, of these workers in the field. Um, think of, of working in, in a lawn. Somebody hired you to work in the lawn and they say, at the end of this, I'll give you a pizza. And you are mowing the grass, one of those old push mowers that you have to pull the handle on several times. Uh, and you get it running, and, and, and you have to walk all along the field, uh, no riding mower, and then you, you uh, someone else comes along and they help you with the, the, the weed whacker, they, they, they trim up the sidewalks, and you know, somebody comes along at the end of all of it and just sweeps off the, the sidewalk. And at the end, you all get a pizza. And you say, how did they get a pizza? They only had, <laughs> they only swept the sidewalks. I did all that work, and yet all I get is a, a pizza too. But that was what was offered. And, and the generosity of the one who is giving it um, is, is the point. Not deserve has nothing to do with it. No one deserves grace. No one deserves it. But God gives it. He gives it freely to anyone who needs, anyone who asks. Jesus demonstrated this physically when he said to his disciples, I'm going to go and make a place for you. You're going to be part of my kingdom. When, when, when this is over, you are going to have a spot in, in my kingdom. Wow. In Christ's kingdom, that's a great gift. That's amazing. How probably they must have felt about that, that Jesus was offering that to them, a place in his heavenly kingdom. And then at the, the very end, at the crucifixion, as he is suffering, there's a man next to him who hasn't done a thing. He didn't walk with Jesus for, for years. He hasn't lived a life like, like Peter or James or John. He hasn't witnessed the miracles, the, the, the signs and wonders that Jesus did. He didn't put in all the effort of, of denying himself and, and following Jesus. He didn't do any of those things. But at the end, Jesus said, he, he says, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, and Jesus says, you're going to have a place in my kingdom. The very same thing he offered to Peter. The very same thing he offers to those who, who, who put in the, the long hours and the travel. A place in God's kingdom. The good news is, that offer still stands. That there's still a place, and Christ's kingdom for sinners such as us, that, that we are invited, just as everyone who encounters Jesus and, and receives that grace is offered a place. God is more willing to forgive than we are to ask. God loves you, and so do I. Let's pray.
God, there's an old song that, that goes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. We're thankful. You've prepared a place. And you've made that offer to anyone who will receive it. We're thankful that your grace precedes and chases after us. Always calling us into the deeper, into the heart of God, whether it is to experience you for the first time, to walk along this journey of life, or even at death's door. You never give up. We're thankful that you are the kind of God who is not keeping score, but is offering grace. We thank you for our place in your kingdom. Stay true in us and allow your grace to flow out of us to everyone that we meet. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.